Hello and welcome to the first of three one-hour videos sponsored by Hanyang University Erika's e program on academic writing, tailored towards graduate students and seniors. This first video is going to be on planning. Some information about myself. My name is Dr. Kenneth Eckert, and I'm Associate Professor of English Literature here at Hanyang University Erika in Ansan in the English Language and Culture Department. I'm also chair of the English Education Committee, which oversees the mandatory English courses on campus. Why are these videos here? Why were they recorded? Why are you being made to watch them? Understand that I'm addressing a wide variety of viewers in different disciplines and different skill levels, but the basic goals are to improve your planning, writing, and editing of course papers and theses or dissertations, and optimally to prepare you for possible post-graduation academic writing, such as journal articles, monographs, and conference papers. And so this first video is going to deal with lower level concerns, an introduction to writing, basic terminology and theory, and we'll move into, we will move into more difficult topics in the later videos. So the disadvantage to an online video such as this is that you can't talk to me and it's harder for me to know my audience's needs. But the upside is that if I go too fast, you can rewind me and you can also skip ahead or back to the parts of the series that are of more help for you. As well, if I can quote Kenneth Burke, because smart people are always named Kenneth, what possibly sets us apart from animals is that we can think about our thinking. And I do think that these videos, even if you are in a STEM field or scientific field and you are not in the humanities, the ideas and the concepts may be helpful for you at a conceptual plane. Something I regret as a high school student is not taking mathematics class more seriously. And as I've gotten older, I don't use trigonometry on a daily basis, but now I appreciate the diligent or the discipline and the rigor that those subjects were attempting to teach me. I'm hoping the opposite is true here, that you will see something of valuable something of value, even at an abstract level in these videos. When I first began teaching composition in Korea, there really were no textbooks written at a high enough level for the needs of seniors and graduate students. Over the years, I've developed my own materials, which have coalesced into a textbook, writing academic papers in English. I'm not telling you this because you need to buy the textbook. You don't. I'm giving you the material in it right here. But I do want you to know where I'm drawing my material from and how I'm structuring the course, and as well where you can find more information if it's of interest or help for you. Each one of these video episodes will have four different sections, adding up to 12. And this first one is called Starting Out. And what I hope to do is to lay out some basic terminology and also to establish and contextualize the basic concepts and goals of this video series. What do I mean by an argument research paper? For some of you, the definition is unnecessary, and you may have written this sort of paper before. For those of you who have not, I'd like to be precise in my terminology. An argument research paper has an academic tone in writing and in its choice of subject. It typically incorporates outside information or expertise. Most importantly, an argument research paper states a position or analysis on the subject. It does not merely describe or inform, it attempts to prove and persuade. And I'd also like to distinguish argument writing from expository writing, because some students bring a false idea of fairness to this endeavor. Expository writing informs, describes, entertains. It tries to be objective or fair. So there is a, there is a type of writing which does not try to prove. A newspaper article, a Wikipedia article, uh, other news stories or sources 
may take a neutral or objective viewpoint. Argument writing does not. It supports a position or results. It does not try to be fair. Why do we write? Why are we doing this? Why do your professors torture you with these writing projects or dissertations? I suppose I'm biased as a composition professor, but all of the information that our ancestors generated, uh, there would be no faithful or accurate way of transmitting that information to us without writing. So at a broad civilizational level, writing is uh, extremely important. For you, if you're a graduate student, you've already intuited that writing is going to be a central part of your career, that whether you're entering academic, scholarly research, or simply some sort of professional occupation, writing is going to be a large part of it, and it is going to have career implications for you. But at a at a broader level, if you're a university professor, why do you give students writing projects, students who are likely never going to uh, enter a, a writing vocation? Because writing is one of the best ways of teaching critical thinking. And even looking beyond the immediate purposes of a paper or a project, more abstractly, writing teaches you to think in a disciplined way. And rhetoric is in fact the oldest university subject in the West. And it was one third of the ancient Greek trivium, which consisted of logic, grammar, and rhetoric. So the teaching of rhetoric, which is argumentation, persuasion, either at an oral level or at a, a textual written level, that goes back a good 24 centuries. It has a very long pedigree in the West. What is an argument? That sounds obvious. We know what an argument is, but do we? Because in common parlance, an argument implies hostility or anger. And common argument situations are when people are having a, a verbal war on the internet, on Facebook, or in person, they're arguing over who's responsible for an automobile accident. In an academic setting or a scholarly setting, a, a, an argument is not necessarily hostile at all. It can be, but it is not definitionally or necessarily so. And properly speaking, the aim of an academic argument should not be to beat someone or to win, but to convince. And that's why I have this visual analogy here of judges deliberating over a case. And I think that's a good way of seeing an academic argument because the people in this illustration might be friends and they are, they do have a common purpose. They're trying to find the truth and find the best solution. And that might be a good way of looking at an academic argument that you are writing to a friend and your interlocutor is someone who you're trying to help or convince of something. Objection in the house. I'm a student or a non-native speaker of English how can I possibly have something intelligent to contribute when I'm writing a paper for people who may have decades of experience in the subject? Well, if you're writing a paper on campus for a, a course or a thesis or dissertation, it's taken for granted that it's a practice exercise. The professor should not be personally threatened by you taking a different viewpoint. And even if you are writing at a postgraduate level for, say, an academic journal, you may have knowledge that experts do not. And this is particularly so in the humanities, where you may be interpreting or evaluating a piece of text, where, assuming you have intelligent reasons, your opinions are just as valid as someone else's. Objection in the court. I'm a Korean or an Asian or whatever. And my culture's Confucian traditions value harmony, not disagreement. I'm not making fun of such values, they're good values, but I've had students tell me this and I often take it as an excuse or an attempt to evade the project's goals. I have read monographs and articles written by Korean or Asian scholars. They still have a point. They still have a central argument or a position 
that's being pursued, even if those arguments are phrased diplomatically or tactfully, they're still there, they're still clear. I also think that there is some when in Rome going on here, that if you are writing a argument research paper for a predominantly English speaking or Western readership, you need to keep in mind their needs and expectations. I do it too, I'm a Canadian, but if I'm writing an article for a British journal or an American journal, I'm going to slightly tailor how I write to that audience's expectations. Three parts of writing. Why three? It's not some magic number. It's uh, fairly arbitrary here. Although when I do speak about chunking later in this video, the idea of threes make more sense. Here, uh, I'm choosing three parts of writing because that's what I've used in the past to grade papers. Don't worry, I'm not grading you. But you can also see our visual analogy here of a tripod, so it fits. And a tripod has three legs, and none of those legs are optional. If one of the legs is missing, the entire thing falls over. That also applies with these three parts of writing grammar, structure, and content. They're not optional. If one of those aspects is ignored, the writing will be a failure. Grammar is the first tripod leg we're going to look at. And the problem with grammar is that for many of you who are second language learners of English, the assumption is that grammar is all there is, that once you've mastered grammar, you know how to write papers. That's of course, not true. That's not the only skill involved. We need to look at structure as well. And here the visual analogy of a building applies. A building has girders and beams and uh, a scaffolding that helps keep it up. And in writing terms, academic papers have sections, but even within those sections there's a linear flow and a progression of ideas that helps give the paper shape. Or to use a simple concrete example, pretend that this is a smartphone and I'm sending a text message to my friend. Dear Karen, this uh, we're going to meet at the pizza house at six o'clock, see you later. There's a sequence to, those, to that text message, even though it's a short statement. Uh, there's an order to what I've just written. There's a, an introduction or an opening Hello, Karen. There's a body of, of the text, and then there's a closing. See you later. If those sentences were randomized or jumbled, the person reading that message would probably still understand what I wrote. They would be a little confused, but they would be able to parse it out. And if we extend that writing into 10 pages or 100 pages, if there's no structure or sequence to the flow of ideas, people are going to be very confused and will likely abandon reading the project. The third and final leg of the tripod is content, which refers broadly to the information you presented. Did you support your argument with examples? Did, did your argument contradict itself or was it consistent? A related matter is audience. Did you match the material to the needs and expectations of your audience? If it's too difficult, you may confuse them. If it's too easy, you may bore them. Three steps of writing. First, we had three parts. Now we have three steps. And those steps are planning and writing and editing. I'm a little leery about using the analogy of steps because generally we go up or we go down steps in one direction. And sometimes with, with writing, you will plan and then you will write and then you will go back to the planning stage and then you will move forward to editing and then maybe you will forget something or you will realize that what you've written has some problems and you need to return to the planning stage. It happens. It does not mean you're a failure. It's natural. We're human beings. Sometimes we may need to move between these steps. The first major hurdle I have in discussing planning is persuading you to do it at all, because ineffective writers see writing as a one-step task. They don't want to plan because it's extra work. But if you were to 
build a building without a plan, that would be foolish. If you decided we need to save time and you just ran up to the site and slapped up the concrete and the wood, it would all fall down. And you wouldn't save time in the end because you would have to start over and repair the mess you made. And this is what happens when you don't plan. There's several bad things that happen. One is you're scared when you don't plan because you look at the cursor blinking on the screen and you panic and you decide, well, I'll just play on Facebook for a while and then come back. And you end up wasting time because when you don't have a plan grounding you and giving you confidence and giving you a place to start, it's hard to begin the project entirely. Another problem that happens when people don't plan is that the writing lacks consistency or focus. It wanders. Uh, writers without plans may repeat topics or miss topics because they don't have a roadmap keeping them organized. It is possible to overplan. People do it. I did it when I was writing my master's thesis. I spent about three months making 30 pages of handwritten notes for my thesis. I think that was over planning because really what I was doing was procrastinating writing the thing. Uh, it ended up helping me though because when I did write my thesis it went very quickly because every day I knew exactly where I needed to go and what I needed to do and it really did help reduce my stress levels. But that's untypical. Most people under plan. I won't speak too much about writing at this point because it's obvious if you don't write the paper there's no product. Uh, I would like to give you two tips or talk about two subtopics here. One is that you don't need to write your paper in sequence that it is read. I discovered as a university student I wasn't very good at writing introductions so I learned after a while to just skip that step and begin with the body section and then fill in the introduction later. And that's the beauty of word processors, that it's easy to do that. And the, re and the reader will, of course, never know. Another thing I want to tell you is that it's a good idea to experiment to learn what are your best writing conditions. It's unfortunate that every mechanical or electronic gadget has an owner's manual, but we don't. And we're all different. I found through experience that I can write best uh, in the late morning. That's when I'm sharpest. And I need the room to be quiet. You might be different. You might prefer writing at night. You might like music. You might like to be with other people when you write. I think these are things worth experimenting with because they will, again, reduce your stress level. And writing your dissertation is torture enough without uh, writing in conditions that are physically uncomfortable for you. Editing is our last step, and editing, I find, is the secret sauce of writing. I may offend any Francophone viewers here, but my experience is that French food is actually pretty plain. It's a boiled fish or a baked piece of meat. It's the sauce that makes French food delicious, and it's the same with writing, I think, that editing will quickly raise the quality of your final product. And so I think it's good to edit yourself or to have professional help or a trusted friend to help you edit. I also find, and this is my own experience, that it's not a good idea to write and edit on the same day, at least not for me. I find I cannot switch from write mode to read mode that quickly. So I recommend you rest between these two steps. And that leads me to my final point for this chapter or section, that just as I've said, there are some things that are peculiar to my own brain and my own personality, that's going to be the same for you too. That writing is part science and part art. Some of the things I will be discussing in this video will seem rather arbitrary, such as citation standards. Others are simply observations that I'm giving you from experience on human psychology. But some of the writing process is your own personality, and that's a good thing. I, I would not want to make these videos and crank out carbon copies of myself. I would prefer that you take what I'm presenting in these videos, agree or disagree with some of them, 
and find your own writing personality. The second topic or chapter that we're going to be discussing is to go into more depth on planning. And as I've stated, perhaps I have a darker view of human nature, but I think it's our natural inclination to take the easy way out in projects. And when you do not plan, that's exactly what you're doing. You're saving time by not planning, but you're going to spend more time later cleaning up the mess that you made. As I mentioned briefly earlier, one of the many reasons you plan is to reduce your fear level. That when you have a concrete plan grounding you and contextualizing your work, writing is going to be much less intimidating for you. And writing for fun does help, even online or creative writing or social media posts or emails to your friends. It does not need to be academic writing, but if you can, again, associate writing with pleasure instead of pain, it's going to be easier for you to do it. And as I said, a good practice is to learn your body and learn what makes the writing situation more comfortable for you. Planning is essentially narrowing. And an analogy I could use here is a sculptor, whether you're sculpting in stone or in wood. Basically, when you're sculpting, you're removing the wood or stone you don't want and leaving behind what you do want. And that's really what you're doing when you're planning. You're trying to remove all the things that you're not going to write about. And choosing a topic, well, the best case scenario is that your professor gives you the topic and then you don't have to think and you can start off right away. If your professor does not do that and you need to think of your own topic for your writing project, hopefully it's suggested by a class lecture or a presentation or another situation. Failing that, you may need to brainstorm, which involves clearing your head and letting it float and, and letting ideas rummage around through your mind. And you may laugh because I can only tell you what works for me and you may need to experiment for yourself. But if I'm having trouble generating a topic, I will lie on the floor so that I will get more brain, more blood into my brain, or I will do some menial activity. I'll take a shower or go for a walk or wash dishes. An activity like that that lets your mind float and randomly associate ideas may help you generate a usable writing topic. So, I'm going to lay out my heuristic, my process, what I do to move from topic to narrow down into an arguable thesis position so that I can plan my paper. And what I do is I decide on a working position, on a temporary argument or general idea of where I'm going with the paper. And that way I can build confidence in what I'm doing, but also it helps me narrow my work because this is going to sound uh, counterproductive or the opposite of what you might think. Writing a narrow paper is easier than writing a broad paper because when you write a narrow paper, you will do less research and more focused research. And it's going to be easier for you to juggle all of these ideas in your head. This is something that my students learn slowly because their natural inclination is to give themselves as much wiggle room as they can in their topics. So students will tell me, I'm going to write a paper on globalization. Really? Uh, you can't write a short paper on globalization. It's too big. All you're going to end up with is a very light skiff of, of ideas or really just a list of topics. That's just too large for a paper. And this is a skill that's not going to come to you automatically. It may take you years to develop this, uh, to develop this practice. But what you need to do is to match the topic to the paper length. And I'll say it again, as much as you may believe the opposite, generally a narrow topic is both easier to research and write on, and it's more interesting to read. How can you narrow a topic? I'm going to give you some rather artificial ways of doing this. And you may say, well, I don't want to use these forms. They, they feel too uh, 
constricting to me. That's fine. They're just suggestions or tricks that you might apply. But uh, say, for example, you're writing an engineering paper on an engineering process that you're evaluating or describing. How could you narrow this to make it a more manageable sized paper and to make it more interesting? You could narrow by concept. How does this affect? How does this have political travel, cost, pollution, ramifications? By demographics, who does this affect? Elderly people, women, fathers, students. By geography, is there a particular uh, region or, or nation or zone where this effect is particularly relevant? By time period, or is there a case study that helps effectively illustrate this issue? Some examples, I know these may not be particularly relevant if you are not in English literature, but that's my field, deal with it. I'm going to give you a concrete example, and these are in fact student papers that I have had in the past. If I get a thesis on Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone demonstrates the value of courage. To me, that's a pretty boring paper. Hermione in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone demonstrates the value of courage. That's a little better, that's more specific. There's something more tangible for you to work on with that. Hermione in the first train scene in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone demonstrates the novel's value of courage. Now I'm curious, why that one particular train scene? What is it about that scene that's interesting? Another way of narrowing down a topic into a specific argument is to use an argument frame. And maybe this is easier to uh, define by example than by explanation. Comparison. Comparison is a very familiar or obvious way of designing an argument. Uh, if you compare one thing to another and say it's better or similar or, or different. An analysis paper, that would be uh, common in the STEM field, where you look at an idea or a product or a process and you look at it closely and describe how it works and how the different parts of it connect either at an abstract level or even at a literal level with an object. Process analysis does the same in time to say, well, if this event happened, what were the steps that led to this event? Problem solution papers would be common in the social sciences where you look at a social problem or an issue and say, well, how, what are some ways we can solve this problem? Conventional wisdom papers, uh, that's a paper I like to write, where you look at the expert analysis of an idea or an issue, and you argue, well, I don't agree with them. The solution or the best interpretation of this problem or idea is really this. Again, if these frames help you, if they're a way of coming up with, with specific arguments, use them. If you find them constricting or childish, that's fine. What I do next after I have my temporary argument is I take notes. I go back to the text if I'm writing on a text or I and or I read sources and external journal articles and monographs on the issues presented in the text and I write notes and in the old days, I did this all on paper. Now, sometimes uh, I will have dual monitors and I'll have a computer file on one monitor and the paper I'm writing on the other. This is a scan of an actual note paper that I, I used from years ago. And you can see I have the name of the article and then the, the idea presented that's important and the page number next to it. Why do this? Why do all this extra work? because it's going to save you work later when you're writing the paper. Because sooner or later, this is going to happen to you, just as it happened to me in high school. You're going to be writing your paper and you're going to remember, oh yes, there was a great quote that I saw in one of those books. And you're not going to remember where it is. And you're going to waste a, a great deal of time searching through your sources for that material and you're going to save a, a huge amount of time when you have a piece of paper laying out where that information was. 
Outlining could be done before, during, after your note taking. It doesn't really matter. And an outline is your plan on paper. And yes, my students will say, I keep my ideas in my head. That's not a good habit. You can do that when you're writing a few paragraphs. But when you expand that writing project to pages and pages and chapters, it, become, it becomes progressively impossible to keep straight all of these ideas. So an outline, again, is just some physical, textual, or picture-based thing on paper or on a screen that helps you organize and remember the, sequ the sequencing of your ideas, or at least a, a sort of map of the topics that you're going to cover. The good news with an outline is that it can look however you like. It doesn't matter. No one's going to see it. If you're not proud of it, you can rip it up and throw it away after you're done. But I do think that with an outline, you get what you pay for. If you spend 30 seconds writing one, it's not going to help you very much. An outline could be very old school in number or point form style. It could be more like a flow chart for a computer science major, or it could be simply circles and lines and arrows in different colors. Below that, you can see another scan of an outline that I wrote myself in the past. And that's sort of a hybrid because it's sort of point form, sort of visual. Again, there's no rules. If it helps you understand and keep track of your ideas, it's always right. In this chapter or section, I'm going to speak about thesis statements, which refers to the sentence or set of sentences, which declares the basic argument or claim of your paper. And maybe you're thinking, come on, you're spending an entire chapter on a sentence? Yes, I am. It's that important. You can see the icon of the anchor here, which is really a small piece of metal that's holding or anchoring a giant ship. And in the same way, your paper really does stand or fall based on that sentence or pair of them. Remember that I'm speaking about a thesis statement, a sentence or a set of sentences not a thesis paper, such as a graduate student writes. To me, there's three functions that a good thesis statement carries out. One, it specifies the subject of the paper. Two, it states the writer's position on the subject. Three, it indicates what the major topics will be. Bicycle paths are a good idea because they will promote fitness and reduce strain on roads. Yes, it's sort of a kiddie thesis statement, but it's simple on purpose. To help, under, to help illustrate the concepts. What's the subject? Bicycle paths. What's the writer's position? They're a good idea. Why? How? They will promote fitness and reduce strain on roads. So we know what the paper is about, what it's arguing, and we have a pretty good idea of where the sequence of arguments will go in the paper. You can see some other examples here. Ralph in Lord of the Flies is a better leader than Jack because blah, blah, blah. This research will show that science picture books highly affect blah, blah, blah. It's not always going to be three reasons, but I'll get to that in a moment and you'll see a rationale why my examples have such a numbering. By far, the biggest problem I have in undergraduate papers with thesis statements is that students don't want to tell me their thesis, either because they're shy and they don't want to be too aggressive or assertive in their claims, or they are conditioned to surprise or keep the audience in suspense. Because for many second learners or additional learners of English, your experience of learning the language is through making class presentations or short speeches. And many of you bring those sorts of paradigms or thought patterns into writing a paper. But an argument paper is not a speech or a movie narrative. It is not a story. And there is no reason to keep the reader in suspense. And if you don't know what a paper is trying to argue, you've already, you already have the cognitive burden of trying to understand some difficult concepts. And it makes things harder if you don't know where the paper is, is going or what it's trying to claim. Professors have to read your paper. That sounds 
rather cold, but it's the job of your teachers and professors to read your work. It's not of a stranger. And if someone is reading your paper on the internet and they're on page three and they still don't know where the paper is going, they may lose patience and give up. Some of you may be thinking, yes, but some of the experts in my discipline or some of the scholars or professors that I've read on, they don't do this. Sometimes they're not clear in their arguments. There's a word for such papers. They're bad ones. At a content level, these writers might be highly competent. Uh, from the perspective of composition theory, this is not a good way to write. And again, it just makes things harder for your reader when they can't contextualize your ideas. This again may sound a little childish, but I mean it. Uh, often the word about is a danger sign for me when I see it in a thesis statement. My paper is about whether Higgins would be a bad husband for Eliza in Pygmalion. That tells me the subject, but that's it. I don't know whether Higgins would be a good hus a bad husband because you didn't tell me. This is the place to tell me, answer that question. The second example, because of Higgins's characteristics in Pygmalion, he would be a bad husband. Better, not bad, but I think it could be improved. Because Higgins and Pygmalion is childish, narcissistic, and uninterested in personal feelings, he would be a bad husband for Eliza. Good. This is not a good thesis statement because it's longer. Don't fall into that trap of thinking. It's good because it's clear. I know your position. Well, I know your subject. I know your position. And I have a pretty good idea of the sequence of arguments that you're going to discuss in your paper childish, narcissistic, and uninterested. And you can see more uh, other, other examples here in non-humanities fields. People's fear of AI is an important problem. Gee, thanks. Okay, people should not be afraid of AI because it has valuable applications. Better. And the third example again, people should not be afraid of AI because blah, blah. Much better. Again, now we know where the paper is going. You may want to road test or stress test your thesis and look at your own thesis from the perspective of an adversary. Are there possible flaws or ways that the thesis might fail to accomplish its goals? One thing you might ask about your own thesis statement is, does it do more than describe? And the thing about thesis statements is that facts usually make terrible thesis statements. Because if you've stated a fact, there's not much left to do. If the thesis of your paper is Queen Elizabeth is the Queen of England, what are you going to write about after your introduction? So conversely, facts don't make good thesis statements. As well, this sounds counterintuitive, but is your thesis statement falsifiable? In other words, can you theoretically disprove your thesis? If you have written a thesis statement that can't be disproven in any way, that might be an alarm bell to you that it's problematic. And I suppose the trick, and this trick is not going to come to you overnight, it may take years for you to develop it, and maybe trick is not the best word. The goal of designing thesis statements is to avoid both of these extremes of can't be proven and can't be disproven. And optimally what you want to do is find that interesting middle ground where there's space for discussion and argumentation. But do your best. Phrasing thesis statements, as crude as it sounds, as concrete and boring as it sounds, eventually it needs to be a sentence. Your thesis statement ultimately, ultimately needs to be carried by words. Or two, you might need more than one sentence for your thesis statement, but I'm recommending that you try to write one. And the reason is that multi-sentence thesis statements may confuse the reader, because if there's five or six sentences that carry your thesis, the inclination of the reader is to look for the one sentence that's the main part 
of that sequence or to try to place the sentences in a sort of hierarchy. My own dissertation was 630 pages, but my thesis statement is one sentence. Granted, it's a long sentence with lots of semicolons, but it's one sentence, and to me that's a good objective to shoot for. If you're having trouble moving from ideas into a actual sentence, you might use Dr. Eckert's Universal Thesis Machine Patent Pending, which works like this, your opinion plus because plus reasons. People should do X because A, B, and C. The results show X because A, B, and C. That's a good place to get started if you're stuck. And if you're thinking, boy, that's childish, I don't want to be so constricted or limited, that's fine. It's just a way to get you rolling, and you can, of course, make it prettier or fancier. Why three? Why do I keep giving you sets of three? Well, there's no rule. There's no tablets that descend from heaven saying, thou shalt have three reasons. But I find in practice and from my own experience, one to four reasons are optimal. And I'm drawing the reasons from cognitive theory that with too many reasons, people start to forget them. Or again, they may try to categorize or place these reasons within hierarchies. And that's the way human beings are. We're not alligators. An alligator can eat something in one bite. We can't, we have to chew on things in small pieces. And our brains are the same. We digest or we evidently or apparently we digest ideas best in small chunks. And as evidence for this, something I've noticed in is that pretty well every country in the world I've visited, people chunk telephone numbers into groups of two or three or at most four. And if someone gives you a telephone number that's a straight series of nine or ten numbers, you're unlikely to remember it. Here are some more examples of what I think are effective thesis statements, either ones I've written or students have written for me, and they have anywhere up to four reasons. Sometimes if the argumentation or ideas are clear enough, one or two is perfectly adequate. I'm not going to read all of them because that's pretty boring and our space is limited. So if this is helpful for you, you can pause the video. Where do we put our thesis statement in the introduction section? You're probably expecting me to give you some rule and there isn't one. My experience is that it doesn't really matter. You could put your thesis statement anywhere in your introduction. Typically, they gravitate towards the beginning or the end of your introduction section. Which one is better? There isn't one that's better, but I don't think you need to overthink this, and it will probably feel more natural in one place or the other. I find that if the thesis argument is fairly self-explanatory or easy to understand, it might be more effective at the beginning if you need some explanation or setup to contextualize or define your ideas, it might go better at the end. But again, it doesn't really matter. You could put it in the middle or anywhere inside the introduction section. If you do that, it might be a good idea to tell the reader because that's not typical. So you might have some explanatory language such as this paper's argument is. I'll speak more about meta-language or signposting of your ideas. One trick that I've developed over the last few years that I find effective is that if I have quite a long introduction section of multiple pages, putting your thesis statement at the end of it is asking for trouble because you may test the patience of your reader who's wondering when are you going to get to your point. What I've done in these situations with longer papers is that I've had a short paragraph at the beginning of the paper, which very briefly summarizes my thesis argument. And then that prepares the reader for the full explanation of your thesis at the end of the section. I'll speak 
I'll also speak more about this in a later video, but don't let your abstract do this work. That's not the function of an abstract. Cultural styles. Where you place your thesis statement in your introduction section may also be may also be affected by your own cultural traditions. I've noticed that Korean rhetoric often has a little more discussion or warm up before it gets into the gets into the arguments. Americans tend to be quite straightforward. They are more uh, it's more typical for them to begin the paper with their basic arguments. But this isn't there isn't a right or wrong way to do it. And there is a subfield in composition rhetoric which talks about this, how different cultures get to the point and at what speed. Again, there isn't a right or wrong way to do this, but as a caveat, if you're writing a paper for a predominantly Western or English speaking audience, when in Rome, make at least some attempt to anticipate and accommodate the expectations of your readership. A note on titles. Why here? I suppose because a good title and a good thesis statement are best friends, and a good clear title which hints and telegraphs your paper's subject and position helps prepare the reader for the paper's contents even before they've begun to read it. And what I sometimes get in undergraduate papers is titles that sound like Broadway musicals, Cats, The Phantom of the Opera, and that may sound rhetorically dramatic, but it doesn't give me much information on the paper's contents. Sometimes I get titles which are the literal assignment name, paper number one, which tells me nothing. Again, serious academic writing tends to have longer and more descriptive titles. It looks more professional, and as well, if you write a paper which is going to be indexed or categorized on the internet, you want to have lots of search terms in your paper so that someone may find your paper by typing these words into an academic search engine. More on that in a future video episode. This next section is going to be on structure in more detail. And in the previous chapter, when I spoke about thesis statements, sometimes students will ask me, why do I need to worry about a thesis statement? Can't the reader just pick up my meaning as I go along? You could maybe do that in a one-page paper. You certainly can't in a 20-page paper. The reader will be lost. The same applies to structure. And to use my architectural analogy here, if you were building a pop tent or a very small a very small building, you might not need to worry about structure as much. If you were building an office tower, you certainly do, because without a methodical organization to how the building is put together, it will all fall down. And the same applies to writing, that if you have a longer piece of writing and the reader doesn't understand the components or sequence of your writing, all that wonderful content is lost. If this were a linguistics class, we might say the basic unit of writing is a morpheme or a letter. At the level of academic writing, maybe it's more useful or functional to speak about our basic unit being a paragraph. And paragraphs actually were not common in English writing until the early modern era, say Shakespeare's time. Previous to then, medieval English manuscripts just had continual text, with occasionally a capital letter indicating a new section. For that reason, they're difficult to read because they're fatiguing on your eyes. There's no logical place to stop. And that's really what paragraphs do. They give you a place to stop and rest and continue. And remember what I just said about chunking. Paragraphs also serve this purpose. They allow you to take in difficult material, stop, think about it, and then give you a visual marker as to where you can continue. And so that's, that's what you should be driving at when you design your paragraphs. They should have one unifying topic that holds that paragraph together. 
A common question I receive is, how long should paragraphs be? There isn't a rule, just like there isn't a rule where thesis statements go in introduction sections. You can have long and short paragraphs. My own rule of thumb is that I don't allow a paragraph to get beyond one page because that to me is too fatiguing for the reader. Otherwise, I think variation is good. The basic unit of essay construction is the five paragraph essay. And you may recognize this, you may have been taught this in high school. Many students all over the world have some sort of analog to this. This may be new to you, in which case I'm going to walk you through this a bit. And if it's not new to you, or you may feel this is a bit kiddy, particularly if you're already writing seminar papers or working on a dissertation, I will be filling this in and complicating this with more advanced subsections such as methodologies and literature reviews. But for right now, to stick with the basics, a five paragraph essay has an introduction section, normally with your thesis statement, and then body sections, each with topic or controlling sentences, which indicate the subject or the argument of that section, followed by a conclusion. Hopefully you've already anticipated that this is an abstraction. It of course needs to be expanded as our paper gets longer. We'll get to that as well. Well, I'm already giving you variations on the five paragraph model. And one variation is that while writing an introduction, you might feel that it's becoming too long and too cumbersome. What might help you is to take some of the background or definitional information from your introduction and create a second background paragraph or section after your introduction before your body section. I do think proportionality is an important topic though. And what I mean by that is relative sizes and lengths of these different sections. And I'm using my hamburger analogy here, that if you have a hamburger that is all bun or all meat or all lettuce, it wouldn't taste very good. And ideally, I think our platonic form of a hamburger has a certain proportionality to it, that a certain percentage is bun and a certain percentage is cheese or meat. And the same thing applies to an academic paper, that if one section is too small or too large, it feels out of proportion. And I have some pretty typical metrics here. I, I find introductions work best when they're about 20 to 25 percent of the paper. And for a three-page paper, that's about a half to three quarters of a page. And you can see my other calculations here. And these aren't rules. They're just uh, parameters I, I find are, are helpful from my own experience. Because a too short introduction can feel rushed or vague but a too long one may feel boring and the, the reader might start to feel impatient. When are you getting on with the body of your paper? Transitions refer to the meta language or the signposting of your writing. I mentioned that a bit earlier on. These are the words and phrases and even sentences that direct your writer as to where the reader is in the sequence of the paper. For example, first, second, moreover, in addition, finally, words and phrases such as this. Some writers and disciplines prefer explicit headings and subtitles. Some people like to have lots of these transitions, other people not so many. I tend to use a minimal number myself because sometimes first and second is obvious to the reader and they may waste space. But I think much of this is, again, personal or disciplinary preference. I'm jumping ahead from the body sections to conclusions. And I think conclusions are important. They're the last impression the reader has of your paper. And if it's a bad one, that's going to affect how the reader remembers the entire paper. And I should practice what I preach because I'm not always good at conclusions myself. And that's natural. As a writer, you're going to be better and weaker at certain components of writing. 
from my experience, bad conclusions simply run out of things to say, and the paper peters out into nothing, like a collapsed balloon here in the image. Uh, one of the very worst things that students do is they copy and paste text from the introduction, and that insults the reader because the reader can see what you've done. What are some things you could do to write a good conclusion? One thing you could do is to have some interesting new information that leaves the reader on a curious or interested note, but there's a certain balance there. You don't want that new information to be so large or important that it shocks the reader. Another thing I try to do to jumpstart my, my conclusions is to answer the question, who cares? How can you make the paper's topic or information meaningful or relevant to the reader? Because when you write a paper, you are seeing all of the paper at one time. You can see the beginning and the end. It's all in your mind because you wrote it, but the reader can't. And so what I'm telling you here is that remember that your paper is a time-based act, that the reader doesn't know the ending at the beginning of the paper. And so the reader looks at the information in your paper at, in a different way than the reader does at the end of the paper. And at that point, the reader knows more, possibly as much as you do. And so one way of strengthening or improving your conclusion writing is to look forward in your introduction, but look back in your conclusion. In your conclusion, now that the reader knows what you know, what does it mean? Why are you saying this? Or again, how can you make this relevant to the reader? I hope my tone of voice earlier did not suggest I'm mocking the five paragraph model. It's important. It helps you learn. It helps you get started. But there will come a time when you need to move beyond it. And hopefully by now you've intuited that the five paragraph model is a model. It can be expanded. It can telescope. It's fractal. And if you were writing a 100 page master's thesis, you of course can't have five paragraphs. We need to expand it. And how do we get there? How do we, how do we accommodate having a three-point thesis statement, for example, into a, par into a paper that has a hundred paragraphs? Well, there's one way you could do this. You could break down the elements of your thesis into sub-statements. You can see the example here. The government should not institute a sales tax because it would ABC. You might take each of those points and make them into three subtopics. Bureaucracy could split into three sub-arguments, spending and investment. Now we have nine body paragraphs instead of three. Or those could also be divided, which would give us 27 paragraphs, and so on and so on. You don't have to do this. It's just an idea or, again, a way to help you get started. Something else you could do is what I did in my own master's thesis. What I did and what I found to be less stressful and easier to manage was that instead of writing a 100-page paper, I wrote five 20-page papers. And what I did is I had a five-paragraph model and I separated each of those elements into their own paper. So I had an introduction that formed my first paper. My papers two, three, and four were about each element in my thesis statement. And then paper five was a paper about the conclusion. And as a result, I had a hundred pages. When I copied and pasted all of these documents together and smoothed them out nicely, so that's another option you could pursue. And again, if it makes the project less scary, there's no harm. No one's going to know how you got to the finish line anyway. Well, here you can see a photograph of me in 1999 when I was almost finished my master's. And these were the books I consulted for it because there weren't as many internet articles back then. Imagine if I had tried to plan that paper in my head, and if I had 
tried to remember all of the information from every page of those books when I was writing the actual thesis. Well, that would have been madness. I would still be writing it now. So I'm driving home this point again, that planning and thinking about structure seems like it's more work. And it is, but it's going to save you work later on, and it's going to reduce your stress levels. So that's the end of this first video episode. And in the next episode, we're going to be moving on slowly into more advanced topics. I hope this has been helpful for you. And for now, take care.